Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Dr. Kaminsky. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Can you please introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Sure, yeah. Uh, as Robbie said, Dr. Kaminsky from the University of Delaware. Uh, this is my 20th year at, at the University of Delaware. I'm the director of the athletic training and education program there. Um, so basically, we educate students to become certified athletic trainers to go out and provide uh, sports health care coverage for uh, you name it, uh, from uh, middle school athletes all the way up to professional athletes, uh, whether it's in a clinical site, it's in a high school setting, collegiate setting, uh, our students are out there practicing. So that's, that's my primary role at the University of Delaware, but uh, you know, I also wear another hat, and that's my scholarly hat. So I'm a, I'm a researcher as well, and the two primary areas of focus in terms of my career have been uh, early on focused on ankle and ankle injuries. Uh, I've co-founded the International Ankle uh, Consortium back in 2004, and, uh, and that has, has blossomed, and, and, and so that's one avenue. But the, probably the bigger avenue right now has been uh, looking at repetitive head impacts, primarily in the sport of soccer. And uh, I really, over the last 10 years, my focus has really been on youth and youth athletes, youth soccer athletes, to see if there are any long-term effects of uh, heading a soccer ball on brain health, basically. When it comes to head injury versus ankle injury, is it just the importance that people are more aware of head injuries? Cause that's more of a significant spot. Like it's where your brain is compared to ankles. Like, I think I know a lot of people that get ankle injuries all the time from sports. I'm pretty sure if you ask anybody, anybody, you probably know, you know, they'll say something like, Oh, it stopped me from going pro. And they usually use like an ankle or a knee issue or something like that. But when it comes to the ankle versus the head, is it just significant more focus in the direction of the head just because of the brain or, or is there, I guess, maybe more things we can do with an ankle now to be able to repair it? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a great question, you know, because if you think about it in the sport world, especially ankle injuries are, are the primary uh, musculoskeletal injury that's suffered by most athletes. But it doesn't draw the attention that the concussion world has drawn, especially over the last 10 years. It's kind of interesting, you know, in our sports medicine world, it seems like, uh, especially the American media will get on a topic and kind of follow that along. It becomes really, really hot. If you, you might recall 15, 20, 15 to 20 years ago, ACL injuries were really, really hot. You know, they, they were looking at them in men and women, and boys and girls. And a lot of attention, a lot of money was uh, put forth. And then came this concussion issue. And that's, that's really been in the forefront, probably over <clears throat> the last 10 years, especially really, really heavy focus on, on concussion injuries. And so, you know, other body parts probably don't get as much attention and focus, but they're still out there. They're still out there. Well, concussion is like, I remember being in school and there were kids, I mean, even in high school sports, there are kids that are talking about they have a concussion or something like that. And it's like, well, you're playing a high school sport. I mean, how serious is it? And you realize there's actually a lot of damage that gets done. And for a lot of people, you know, we see a game play and we see a player get taken off the field. And then what happens afterwards? Is he coming back? in the game is the main question usually. Um, but no one ever thinks about like, is this person going to be ever be able to play sports again? And that's where you see like ankle issues become a real problem is that you could tear your Achilles. You could tear one of those crucial areas in your foot, a certain ligament, and then you're done. You're that's it. That's the rest of your career is over with. And a concussion is serious. It's your brain, obviously, but you can, kind of heal from that in a sense and it doesn't take too long i think we're getting better with recovery options as well too but there's just i mean you know from just researching into sports is that there's 
this area of like playing even when you're hurt. You know what I mean? Like there's this whole, like, I'm glad there's more of a focus in my opinion of just people paying attention to better recovery options and actually focus in this direction of trying to recover from sports. Cause usually it's like, walk it off or, you know, tough it out. to the end of the game or something like that. And sometimes you can't. Sure. Yeah. No. Um, well, we'll focus on concussions first. You know, I think that <clears throat> what we know now is what well, continues to evolve, but what we know now is, is really the importance of uh, recognition first and foremost, because you're absolutely right. I think that probably there have been situations in the past where kids may have, you know, just thought, oh, I got my bell rung and they stayed in the competition. And now I think that certainly in my area of, of expertise as athletic trainers, you know, the majority of these high school athletes, collegiate athletes have athletic trainers that can help in the recognition of concussions. And then we start the immediate process of treating them and uh, ensuring a safe return to play. Uh, if teams and, you know, for example, maybe youth sports may not have access to an athletic trainer, but at least coaches, I think, and parents are much more in tune to recognizing the importance of if, a, you know, their son or daughter uh, gets injured with a head injury, it's a serious thing and they, they need to be, you know, treated as such. And so I think that the ability for us to recognize them, put them into the treatment system now is much better than it ever was. You know, the, the movie Concussion was based on, you know, Mike Webster, Pittsburgh Steelers. And we just didn't know enough about concussions back then uh, to really handle them in a, in a, in a, in a manner uh, worthy of, you know, appropriate medical care. We know so much more now and it continues to evolve. There's a big meeting coming up in uh, late October in Amsterdam called the Concussion and Sport Group Meeting. And it's held every four years with COVID that disrupted things. So the 2020 meeting has been pushed back to 2022. But that particular meeting drives policy for the entire world. And so I think all eyes are on Amsterdam to see what types of uh, new recommendations in terms of concussion management will come out of that. Um, you know, it, you know, in terms of other joint injuries, whether it's the knee, the ankle, the hip, the shoulder. Uh, <clears throat> again, our, our ability to recognize those and treat them and get them into the system is so much better too. Uh, but you're right. I mean, there are some serious knee injuries that can, you know, sideline an athlete forever. Uh, bad ankle injuries. And then the other kind of downstream effect of those types of injuries is um, osteoarthritis. You know, osteoarthritis begins with a traumatic event. So whether it's a minor ankle sprain, it's a shoulder dislocation, and, and some people are going to develop osteoarthritis to a greater extent down the road, and other people are able to, well, they just, it's old age, it's old yeah. age, but, but that is a downstream effect of, of any major joint injury. So when we talk about concussions, where do you see the research being focused in? Like, do you think it's particular in diagnosing it or being able to like, be able to be aware of it, I guess, sooner? Like if you see some, like, what is a, I guess, a symptom of someone going through a concussion? Is it just hazy memory, not being able to focus clearly? I mean, I've seen people puke before and they've been diagnosed with a concussion. And I think it's easy for a parent to diagnose it in their own kid, but it's also hard if you're standing in the bleachers and trying to be aware of it while the kid's on the field. Um, and then do you think it's maybe more of the area of being able to treat a concussion that seems like the main focus is? Because yeah, being able to um, predict them is difficult. You know, it's it's all encompassing. Uh, a good friend of mine who, who He's actually the chancellor at the University of North Carolina now, Dr. Kevin Guskowitz, world-renowned expert in sport-related concussion. You know, one of the things that he's always talked about is uh, he likens the whole process to puzzle pieces. There are a lot of puzzle pieces in the management of concussion. And whether it's, uh, 
you know, that initial recognition of an athlete who is slow to get up on the field, that's a classic sign that they've probably been concussed. Um, the way they walk, you know, if they walk and they're kind of stumbling, that's another key, key or classic sign of concussion. Obviously, that athlete needs to be taken off the field, off the court, and then evaluated. And then we have a, a, a very good rubric right now. It's called the SCAT-5, the, uh, <clears throat> the Sport Concussion Assessment Tool. And uh, likely in Amsterdam, it will become the sixth version of the SCAT, so SCAT-5 and probably uh, evolve into SCAT-6. But <clears throat> basically, it's a, it's a tool that we can use on the sideline to, to carry out a brief uh, assessment of whether or not the athletes can cost. And if they show any signs or symptoms, they are immediately pulled from competition, not to return that day. And then subsequent follow-ups determine the length of time they're going to be out. Um, most concussions are, are diagnosed that way, basically, in the initial 10 to 15 minute period where we, we can observe we take them through and we look at uh, signs and symptoms and other you know, characteristics. Balance is a big thing. And then <clears throat> um, we make a decision. You know, People think, oh, you need to have this advanced imaging technique, MRI, CT scans. That's not the case. In, in fact, most concussions are diagno diagnosed without those types of uh, uh, tests. It's only in a smaller percentage of individuals who, you know, this, the concussion is suspected as being severe that they may get some advanced imaging techniques. You know, the other hot area in concussion is long-term effects. And, you, you know, in the American media especially has been this issue of CTE, chronic traumatic encephalitis. We know so much more about that than we ever did. And it, but however, it remains a diagnosis after death, okay, after death. <clears throat> what the, the, the researchers are trying to find out is are there any markers of CTE before death? So we can, we can kind of make sure that these individuals are given the right resources and medical care to enhance their life while they're still alive. <clears throat> and right now that's, that's remained elusive, although there are some good research teams throughout the world that are, that are working on that. When did the change in focusing into what concussions are and how important are concussions? It didn't just come from that documentary or that film about concussions, did it? Like, when did you see the, the change of it? I also have to think that with the number of people now that are more willing to talk about if they're hurt or not. Um, it's not just in other, like other sports, but kids, you know, they're being more active in the sense of being aware of something that's going on with them, which I think only helps your guy or anybody that's really diagnosing if someone's injured or concussed on, on the field. Most of the time it was like, brush it off and get on back to the game or something like that. But now in today's time, you have a lot of kids that are saying, Hey, I don't feel good. Maybe you should sit me out for this thing. And then they get checked at. Yeah, no, <clears throat> you're absolutely right. Um, I, I think it was it was pre the movie concussion. Uh, our awareness has gone up. You know, over the last 10, 15 years, the, the amount of knowledge and concussion has just exploded. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that, that I think we're starting to see as a as a positive downstream effect of our educational efforts about concussion and concussion management is that it starts early. And, and, and that's important because I think that, you know, kids that are in, in grade school, maybe grades three to five, that's really when you, you have to influence uh, their behaviors to the point where if they get hit in the head on the playground, if they get hit in the head on the soccer pitch, if they get hit in the head in a peewee football game, they're more apt now, I think, to at least tell their parent, tell their coach, you know, report it to their school nurse. And I think that that's so important because we can get them into the system sooner 
start the process of uh, you know, our management techniques and uh, they're gonna just be so much better down the road. It's those that are you know, undiagnosed, then they go on to get a second and a third concussion and each concussion is sub subsequently worse. And, uh, you know, they set themselves up for long-term problems. So I think that awareness has been huge. And, and if, if there's a positive effect of all of this attention in the, in the media, it's certainly that. I think the immediate attention is good. I just wish, I, like, like I said, when I reached out to you, I came across videos of people playing soccer that would go to headbutt a ball and they would both collide heads. And then someone's having a seizure on the field and a player has to go and stick their hand in that person's mouth and pull their tongue just so they didn't bite on it or they didn't swallow it or something like that. And I was like, well, I know about football. I think the world now knows about football having severe head injuries. I think that's when the NFL started, when this all became more known. The NFL was one of my favorite players, Ed Reed. His main tactic was running head first into people. And then they started giving you giant penalties for that because of how dangerous that was. We can't play that sport like that anymore because now we're understanding the ramifications. So we got to minimize risk. But then you see soccer. I mean, accidental headers, someone, two people going for a ball. I mean, you get tunnel vision sometimes. You totally forget about that. But there's, I, I mean, would that require more safety, like a helmet to wear in soccer? I'm not trying to be that guy. But at the same time, it's like, this is an important thing. And I also bring in the aspect of like, when you do wear safety gear, for instance, rugby versus football with the helmets, I mean, were people more apt to use their head with no protection to it compared to now they have a helmet on. I mean, that was always Ed Reed's excuse was he has this giant helmet on. He can run head first into people. And it's like, you want to, you're trying to find ways to safety measure it, but also like, I mean, bring the example of with kids, peewee football, those kids don't know technique. They're learning, they're getting there. They might develop it, but how many concussions do they have compared to later down the line? I mean, I, I know I'm saying a lot, I'm sorry, but it, 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 it brings up a lot of questions. It has me thinking about stuff. I mean, I don't know how many games I watch of my nephew playing sports or something like that. And I see him and, you know, you see him get hit and he falls down, I like, get up and cheer him back on. But there's a lot of times like I see a kid get hit and they're small kids, maybe six or seven years old. They're just playing, having a football game, you know, a little fun. It's not something serious like how NFL is or something, but you see him get hit and it looks like it visibly takes the wind out of him sometimes. And I'm like, all right, that's a hit. Like have him off to the side. You know, he doesn't need to tough it up because his parents are watching. And I think, you know, there's just there's so many there's so much really questions I have. <laughs> yeah, no, no, all good. So I'll just touch on kind of the three sports that you make mention there. We'll start with football. Again, I, I think there's, <clears throat> there's a, a trickle down effect of all of this. And you're absolutely right. NFL has pumped a ton of money into uh, awareness, uh, concussion awareness, equipment, et cetera. And so I think when you, it trickles down to peewee football, for example, it's important that they preserve the sport of peewee football because eventually those are going to be the kids that ultimately make it to the NFL. A, a couple things at play here. Number one, heads up football. It's a, it's a, it's a program that is infiltrated peewee football and it's teaching good tackling technique to young kids. And without question, over the last 10 years, you've seen that trickle up to the collegiate level and professional football. You, no longer do you see these, you know, these athletes tackling in football with their heads because they know they, they know the importance of keeping their head up and, and using good tackling technique. So I think, number one, that, that's important. Number two is the protective equipment, so much better. Nowadays, at most collegiate and certainly at the professional level, they actually, during practice, they wear this uh, protective pad over their helmet called the Guardian. I, I, that's one manufacturer, there's probably other manufacturers, but it's an extra padded material that's on the helmet. And that helps to lessen all of those contact hits that would come in practice. Otherwise, you know, they'd be out there, helmet, 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 helmet. And I think that's huge. That's, that's gonna be a, a, a really nice uh, advantage moving forward because Lord knows if you, know, you watch last night's football game kick off the NFL season, there were a lot of helmet to helmet hits that 
are unintentional. You know, it, blind men just, it happens during the course of tackling, it happens. No malicious intent, but it happens. So, so there's been some equipment, you know, uh, issues in, in the sport of football that's made it much safer. And so I'm, I'm optimistic of football moving into the future. Are concussions still going to occur? They are. You mentioned the sport of rugby. What's interesting about rugby athletes is that they learn early on how to tackle properly. And that does not involve their head. And it's interesting that some of those tackling techniques have been used now in the sport of American football to teach kids and, and, and high school players how to better tackle. Because the sport of rugby, is it dangerous for head injuries? It absolutely is. However, these, these athletes know how to tackle. Lastly, sport of soccer. You know, you talk about those head-to-head -head collisions. A lot of times concussions in the sport of soccer are during aerial uh, uh, collisions, you know, aerial challenges, if you will. So the ball is there and they're going up to head the ball. And instead of heading the ball, they collide both heads to head, head to shoulder, head to elbow. And that's where concussions occur. So one of the things that I've done specifically in my work with the um, Soccer Coaches uh, Association is, uh, it's called United Soccer Coaches. And we've worked with them to create a program called Get Ahead Safely in Soccer. Get Ahead Safely in Soccer. And so this came out 2015, 2016, shortly after US Soccer put forth a rule that kids age 10 and under could not head the ball. Ages 11 to 13, they be, could begin to head the ball in practice and in games, but there was very little guidance. So we created this half hour uh, educational uh, uh, program for the uh, soccer, United Soccer Coaches that's free of charge, but it would teach coaches how to teach these kids to head a soccer ball properly. And one of the things that we teach is to use your body to create space. So you kind of think of a, a big radius or circle around your body, but when you go up for a, uh, a header, you need to protect that space to keep that defender from getting in there. And so uh, FIFA is a very strong organization. I doubt you will ever see helmets be worn in the sport of soccer. But I do think that if you teach proper technique, you keep good neck strength, um, it can, it, the, the act of heading the soccer ball can be made safe, can be made safe. Do you think a lot of this just boils down to proper education, not only for the workers or the people that are observing the athletes play, but also I think making athletes conscious of when they are hurt. I think there's a lot of horror stories you know, I was told horror stories as a kid about sport athletes and, you know, even uh, the Steelers player after he died, I know you have to check your brain and his big brain was like that of like a 70 year old man. Like you hear a horror story like that and people start thinking a lot more, but I guess your biggest complication would be the aspect of there are certain age groups or certain things you could pinpoint in different sports where there's the, that primal aspect. And that is kids that are going through these hormones or testosterone whatever you want to say and they want to get their anger out and they might have a hard day at school or they might have a hard day at home and this is the place where they can go like i remember doing mma and in the beginning i was keeping up with some of the pro people and the only reason was because i wasn't tactic strategy moving around i was just getting everything all my anger out in this specific thing and that's what makes it difficult for them because then you're unpredictable and then they have to not really try and attack you as much but defend everything that you're throwing at them and it it's good at first but then you learn actually how to do it and you realize that's a terrible way to you, you lose your cool and that's a lot of what sports is i think there's a popular video of a guy that got slammed and he told him i'm going to get you every day or something like that and the dude took his helmet off and he went to go you know push him and, and they he collided heads with the guy who had the helmet on his head starts bleeding i mean there's just even in adults it's there but it's just this this primal anger aspect i mean the whole point is to a lot of people for them is to lay somebody out it's not really to you know play the sport in a sense yeah no no doubt um <clears throat> behavioral change is important 
Um, and, and I do think that student athletes have a vested interest in this process as well. You know, I, I teach about the sports medicine team. And a lot of my students look at me when I say that the sports medicine team is made up of the physicians and the athletic trainers and the coaches and the administrators. And then I'll say, and the student athletes. And they look at me like, they have a vested interest in this process. Very much they do. And again, I think that the educational awareness about concussion, use of your head, um, over time, I think has trickled down. I, I think that kids nowadays are thinking twice. Collegians, I see this especially with collegians. You know, years past that defensive back, when they saw that wide receiver come across the middle, catch the ball, they were just coming in like a heat seeking missile. And I think now they think twice about doing that because they realize what is going to happen five, 10, 15 years down the road. And I just think it's a mindset. I really do. And I think that our efforts as healthcare professionals to, to make more aware uh, those, those athletes of the long-term effects, I think is paying dividends. I really do. I think sports are much safer today than they ever were. I agree. I, I, just, I wonder what the balance is to where you could, I guess, tell a kid or educate them about the injury aspects, but also not scare them away from the sport as well, too. Because you want to you have that impact where they know like, hey, there are these serious dangers that could happen if there's an injury and it could be 10 years, 15 years down the line. But you also don't want to scare them so bad to the point where they're like, oh, maybe I don't want to play sports anymore. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, you, you think about it, in the United States, obesity is such a big issue. And you, you tell kids, oh, you can't play. You're gonna hit, you're gonna just see an explosion of that. Youth sports so important. I mean, I, I yourself benefited from being on a team. Uh, there's so many positive aspects of that. That absolutely. And I just think that you know we make the game safer. We make the game safer, and, and we've done that. Whether it's you know, most of the, the bad rap for concussion comes from sports that are collision type sports, ice hockey, rugby, football, soccer. But we're making those games much safer for kids to play and enjoy and have fun. Yeah, ice hockey is a big one. That's one where I literally see people throw their whole bodies at other people and lay them. I know so many friends that are like, oh, I broke a, a vertebrate or something like that and i'm just like gee like i can't ice skate so i got lucky with not wanting to play that sport at all but i get it i mean i can see it's it, it's just very very complicated something i couldn't understand but i mean the amount of injuries i see in that sport compared to football are way more i don't know if it's just because you're gliding you really can't stop on a dime i mean some people can have you know close to a stop on a dime but you're still it's just there's there's a lot of stuff going on you have a lot of padding on also it's kind of like throwing like you're like it's like being in a car i think the example that I heard about a concussion was like, imagine your brain is this is sitting in this car, which is your skull, and it doesn't have a seatbelt on. So when it goes forward, it doesn't matter if you stop, your brain's just going to hit the front of your head. And then, which I mean, stuff like that, that that's great education. I think that's our prime, I guess, importance in this aspect, which is just teaching kids the dangers of, you know, going down this or doing something that you got to be aware of, hey, don't let don't lose your cool, you know, make sure you're paying attention. I think being aware of that is a good thing, but also like, I mean, when it comes to the sports safety as well too, there's all, I guess a good amount of people I would say that want sports safety, but there's also people that feel like it interferes with the game, which to me is like a dumb argument. Cause I, I consider safety a little bit more important. Um, just cause you see that, like I said, the horror stories of things. I mean, you shouldn't be in high school throwing up cause you have a concussion. If someone's warning you when you're a kid telling you don't go to bed or don't close your eyes cause you're dealing with a concussion, that's stuff that lasts trauma in so many aspects. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, you, you know, again, awareness is, is hugely important. And, um, you know, you, you talk about sport ice hockey, like other sports, the rule changes have just been immense over the last 10 years. You know, you think about uh, checking and, and, you know, no from behind checking, limited checking when the kids are younger that's all hugely important, not only for head injuries, but neck injuries as well. And yeah, you know, sport of ice hockey, there's a risk. You take a risk, you, that risk of getting injured. But again, I think the, the positive benefits that you get from playing sports, whether it's ice hockey, football, other sports, 
just just so much in my eyes outweigh any risks that you take about getting injured. Because, you know, I, I just think that th- those are lifelong lessons moving forward. When it comes to the long-term effects of concussions, like whether it's diagnosed, I mean, how, how does one go undiagnosed? Like, is it, I feel like eventually it has to be diagnosed at some point or can you just heal? Yeah. You know, again, the, the downstream effects are, you know, the p- potential for dementia, um, perhaps CTE. Again, it's a, a post-mortem diagnosis. Uh, you know, though, those are concerning. I think that, uh, you know, for example, I, I think this is playing out before our eyes. Uh, two, two, two former NFL players who I'm sure you know of, uh, Troy Aikman and, and Steve Young. You know, they're both broadcasters now. And so I, 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 I watch every year to see, you know, the little nuances in their language. You know, is there anything that you can pick up that makes them a little bit slower? Or, you know, is, are they forgetting things on the air? Because you think about the number of concussions that the two of them had in the course of their career, and they even talk about it nowadays, that went undiagnosed or they played through it. And so to me, it's unfolding before our eyes. How are they going to be, you know, as they, they're in their 40s and 50s now, you know, how are, how are they going to be moving forward? So I think that little nuances such as that, you know, I think people recognize that. I think at the University of North Carolina, they have this uh, center for uh, retired NFL players there where they, they monitor these former athletes that come in, they test them, and then they test them through throughout their life. And I think that, again, early recognition of some of the signs and symptoms of dementia, I think, are important so that the, the necessary resources, medical care, treatment, et cetera, can be imparted, I think, are hugely important. And again, I think just awareness. Is, is, is so much better today than it ever was. You know, guys like Mike Webster, you could tell in the movie, you know, that that was real. You know, that was that was based on, on real life is that, wow, he, he suffered a lot. He suffered a lot. And I think nowadays, you know, athletes are much more in tune with their bodies and they're willing to let people know, let people know. I, I think so too, but I also just like when the people that speak out about it, they happen to be retired or they happen to be, you know, not playing actively in the sport as well too, that are openly speaking about the dangers of it, like the broadcasters and stuff of that sort. I feel like it's much more difficult to come out and say something like that when you're actually playing the sport. Cause a lot of times you're so in tune to a routine, you're so in tune to a workout, you're so in tune to just the everyday process that like stopping to really take account for your body. I mean, unless you're soaking in an ice bath or you're focusing on your inside or internal injuries or something like that, that you might be dealing with it, whether you got roughed up from the game before. I mean, that's just a, a lot of people don't even think about this type of stuff. They're worried about what they're going to be doing when they get done practice, what they're going to be doing when they get done with their workout. I mean, I think there needs to be like a good overall process body check, at least when it comes to just a person. Yeah. Program. Again, I think awareness is there. Um, you know, you get to the professional level. I think there's, there's an awareness certainly collegiate level, there's a lot of educational efforts being put forth about concussion and, 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 you know, speaking out about it. And I think student athletes nowadays much better than they ever were, you know? Um, And I just think that the, just an overall awareness of the dangers of playing certain sports, because again, CTE typically starts with repetitive head impacts. How many, I, I, you know, I think that's still unknown. But, um, and so I think people are aware of that, that that could occur later in life. And so there's things in place to help mitigate that. Like I mentioned earlier, the practices with the, the protective padded helmet on top or the protective padding on top of the helmet, I think is going to pay huge dividends down the road. Uh, I think you know, educational awareness, rule changes, all for the better, Robbie, all for the better. 
when it comes to recovery processes of a, of a concussion, are there any experimental ones out there? Like things that really don't get talked about? Like I noticed like stem cells, for instance, in our society have made a complete different change before, like three or four years ago, people had to go to a different country to even go and talk about that type of treatment. And then it just became normalized all of a sudden. I'm just wondering if there's anything with ice? Is it heat? Is it you something? You know, it's uh, a good point. I mean, I don't think it's gotten ex as extreme as stem cell mm -hmm. uh, stem cells with concussion. However, one of the important aspects, and I think a lot of people don't understand this, is that a period of initial rest following concussion is important, but we're finding that low-level exercise is, is crucially important in helping to assist the recovery process. I'm not talking about going out and running a marathon or swimming three miles. However, I am talking about getting the athletes after that initial maybe two, three day rest period to where they are active again. Maybe some low level treadmill walking in a pool where they're, they're buoyed and they're, they're just walking in the pool. To get their heart rate up, we're finding that low level exercise so, so important in the healing process in the healing process. And that goes for other musculoskeletal injuries. It's just now we're seeing, okay, if it works for a knee injury or ankle injury, perhaps the same can hold true with concussions. And we're starting to see that. Is that just because of a spark up of endorphins? Like I notice if I do like three hours of cardio or something, my, my ADHD feels like it goes away. Like I can focus. Yeah. I think there's, you know, hormonal effects uh, are, are important. There's certainly physiological effects of that uh, on brain health and inflammation um, are all very, very important. And, and that's why this low level exercise is, is so important. Our fo the folks at the University of Buffalo have done a lot in, in that area with concussion treatment. And uh, I think it's beginning to trickle down now where it's become mainstream as part of our uh, initial care and treatment following concussion. Look at most concussions, probably 85%, 80% will resolve in, in 10 to 14 days. So athletes are probably gonna be out for two weeks. Um, that's an initial concussion. There's a small majority that don't get better and uh, for, for various reasons, whether it's, it's concomitant neck pain, uh, it's concomitant musculoskeletal injury, um, maybe vision issues, they're in a select group of say 15 to 20% that don't get better right away. And they're a challenge for us from a, from a, from a clinical standpoint, they're a big challenge. But nonetheless, the majority of those concussions if treated well initially, we'll get better in 10 to 14 days. You mentioned initial rest, like that two to three days of rest. Why was I always warned not to go to bed if I had a concussion? Yeah, I, again, that's kind of a myth. Because um, rest is important. We need The brain needs to rest to, to begin the healing process. Um, and so, and another thing that we're finding too, I think that's important is, is cognitive rest as well. So it, it's probably not a good idea for a concussed athlete to uh, you know, go back home and start to solve complex calculus problems, for example, or spend hours on the machine. Cognitive rest is important initially because again, the brain is undergoing this inflammatory process to help it heal itself. And so, we need some, some of that rest early on. And then we, it's a gradual process where we, we athlete meets certain benchmarks and we then get them into the, into the, uh, into the rehabilitation program, which involves this low level exercise. Well, besides some of the major serious ones, like when it comes to cognition, like if we're talking about dementia, we're talking about CTE, when it just comes to some minor stuff that are important, like I, we talk about like something that if someone goes through a concussion, something that might not get back to normal or maybe is a fear, not like dementia. 
um, but just minor things like can there be frustration issues? Can there be stress issues? Can there be education? There can be behavioral issues. Yeah. I mean, we need to be in tune with that. And I think as healthcare professionals, athletic trainers, we are in tune with that. Um, another area that has probably taken some the forefront over the last five to 10 years, the eyes. The eyes have it. There are a lot of things that clinically we assess certain things, balance, memory, um, cognition, and they may return to normal levels in 10 to 14 days. And that's driving our return to play decision. Okay, check, 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 check. However, up until the last five to 10 years, we never really looked closely at the eyes. And now we're starting to see that there could be some subtle changes in the eyes that are not healing at, at the speed that we want them to heal. And so sometimes these athletes, they have long-term, they have some vision disturbances that we, okay, we're, not, we're gonna hold you back from returning to play until those resolve. And some ongoing neck pain as well. So the cervical, obviously the head's connected to the neck, could be some long-term cervical issues. Uh, some athletes have long-term balance issues that we've got to resolve before they can go back. So those are some of the telltale signs that we, 25 years ago, we didn't do this. We didn't assess this. Is When you mentioned the going to sleep thing was a myth, is there other things like that that you guys have learned in like the past 10 years compared to what we've known about concussions longer than that, that have been kind of debunked in a sense? Um, you know, the other thing I, I'll just mention with concussion, and I heard, I think, at Dr. Bill Meehan from up in Boston say this, that most concussions are not an emergent issue, meaning, you know, a lot of people freak out, oh, yeah. it's a concussion, it's a concussion, they freak out. In most cases, they are not an emergent situation, emergency, in other words. And I, and I think that's important, you know, they are serious, uh, but if gotten into the medical system appropriately and with the appropriate care and, and uh, triage, most people will get better. Most people will get better. And their brain, brain's very resilient. Yeah. Very resilient. Yeah, that was always a giant fear. As soon as someone said that they had a concussion or something, they were immediately like the first person to be treated or, you know, yeah, some yeah, type yeah. of emergency oh. scenario. Yeah, they're not going to be around tomorrow or something like that, which I, it brought up a fear. I think that's uh, especially a giant fear because you hear it so much, especially when I was in high school. I don't know how many players I would hear or just friends of mine, students that I was with in class or something that would talk about having a concussion. And, you know, they it, that just hearing that you start wondering, I mean, that's your brain. And, you know, for a lot of people, a lot of people are more conscious about the you know, head injuries and stuff of that sort. Um, just kids my own age, you know, younger generations now are more probably focused on keeping their head a little bit safer just because we know so much more now. But when it, com when it comes to the ankle aspect, I mean, when did that, I mean, ha have we always been weary of, I guess, ankle injuries and how those can kind of happen? I mean, I don't really see significant, you know, tears every day or something like that but we know about them and they're kind of like i think one kid in my uh, school tore his heel i don't remember the specific term for it but i mean he, he couldn't walk he still walks with like a, a limp like he's not he's and this was like in middle school he was playing football and someone i guess landed on top of him and he twisted a certain way and it ripped and he had to go get surgery he was out for i think the rest of the school year after that and he hasn't been able to walk and we're in our 20s now and he hasn't been able to walk the same so i mean have we gotten better at treating those? Do we understand those better? Are those a bigger issue that we need to worry about? Yeah, no, cool. Good, good segue kind of changing over to the, you know, I got the head and the, the, the lower leg ankle covered, right? From head to toe, anything in between, don't ask me any questions. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was going to ask you some more. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the issues that we've, we've kind of dealt with over the last 20 or so years in the ankle world has been this issue of, of chronic ankle instability. And it used to be that the old adage was just an ankle, ankle sprain, it'll get better, heal on its own, you'll be fine. 
But what we're seeing is there's, there's a pretty large percentage, maybe somewhere probably 40%, maybe 30 to 40%, could be higher in some individuals, that we start to see long-term effects. So it's like that if you're playing without an anterior cruciate ligament in your knee, you have this trick knee, so to speak. It's very unstable. Same thing happens in the ankle. You do damage to these ligamentous structures and it disrupts the normal mechanics of the ankle joint itself, leading to this long-term instability. And that's a huge problem. People talk about, you know, I just stepped off a curb and my ankle went. I'm walking on uneven terrain, my ankle goes out. That's classic ankle instability. So this fear of giving way. And our organization, especially the International Ankle Consortium has really done a lot to advance the knowledge of ankle instability throughout the world. Because as I mentioned at the outset of our talk today, ankle sprains remain the, the number one uh, injury, musculoskeletal injury in athletes. And so you take that, and then if you went to any emergency department, probably the number one musculoskeletal injury that comes in on a daily basis are ankle injuries. You know, you've got a large population of individuals who have the potential for developing long-term problems. And so I think that, you know, our focus, our attention on that, uh, the importance of early care, uh, early medical care. So just not saying, oh, I can walk this off, I'll be better. I think is, is a good good message to send to people with ankle injuries. <clears throat> well, I would say the brain would probably be everyone's most important just because it's your head. But the one that gets the most used would be your feet and your legs. Um, and even that, I mean, I, I have terrible wrists. I My wrists, they crack like crazy when I you know, whatever. And I have to wear braces when I bench press. Cause if my wrists go back to a certain point, they just feel like they're going to snap. I mean, you don't worry about this stuff when you're a kid, you know, you think you're indestructible, but then I'm in my twenties, right? I'm only 24. And then I'm seeing people like I saw a person in the emergency room that was literally on one of those like little scooter things. They were a little bit older than me. They could not have been over 30. They could, they, they're a little bit under 30, but they had like a cooler and everything. Like they had been used to not being able to use one of their legs for a very long time. And, you know, they just seemed like they were in a terrible position. Like they were just, it, they did not seem mentally well. Um, they were kind of rude to the person at the desk. And you realize this person is going in to get whatever looked at in their leg. They probably have had this issue for a very long time. They probably can't use it normal, probably maybe something from sports. I don't know, but it's a real fear. I mean, I work at a gym. I see the number of people that come in in their forties and their fifties or in their late thirties. And they talk about, I have this injury or my shoulder doesn't work so well. And you just start being more conscious about your body, about what you're doing to it. And you don't realize like the small things. I have friends that will roll an ankle, just walking on the lawn. I've never rolled an ankle. I don't know how that happens, but if for some people, that's how their bodies just, absolutely, it, it's crazy. Yeah, it's real. And and again, one of the things that we've really pushed in the International Ankle Consortium, we have several position statements that have been published through the years, is, is the early awareness and getting seeking appropriate medical care is so, so important. Again, the old adage, oh, I'll just walk it off, you'll be better. It, it, it's going to lead to long-term issues. And, and, and in some cases, as you, you know, mentioned, in, in your little discussion there about the person you saw in the ER is that the, the lack of movement is, is, is very detrimental to overall physical health. And, you know, one can look at diabetics, for example, who, who can't get up and walk they have a whole host of concomitant issues, not only their diabetes, but other things. So you can see that it has a trickle down effect. You can't walk, you can't move. It's gonna affect your overall health. In fact, one of my former students and now colleague, um, Dr. Tricia Hubbard Turner, who's at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, she wrote an editorial for my uh, journal a few years ago that the headline read, ankle sprains can lead to cancer. I mean, Twitter was lit up. It's like, what do you mean, you know? 
but what she the point she's trying to make is that you know that the lack of movement due to an ankle injury can lead to long-term instability and issues with just ambulation and gait that you know it potentially could lead to serious things like cancer because you're just not moving you're not active <clears throat> I mean, what can we do as just, I, I would say in society's way to make sure people can become more active. Like I work at a gym. I tell people don't, you don't have to work out. Like don't feel pressured to work out. I've done it every day for 10 years. When COVID was shut down, I was at a key to my facility and I would just go there and work out. For me, it's a, it's, it's so ingrained in my routine. It's like checking a phone in the morning, but I tell people it's that first two weeks is the most difficult, but you see a lot of people that come in, they sign up and they give up after a couple of days. Now that's pressure from other people that are in the facility as well too but there's just i mean a lot of people feel like they have to get a gym membership because you know they don't like the way that they look and, they, and a lot of that's pressure from the outside world or other things around in their town or city friends whatever you want to say you know taking bikini photos i live in a beach town i live in ocean city you know right, so right, sure that's 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 a common thing people post up a beach pic and they go oh i should get in the gym or something like that and I don't think that's healthy to do it like that. I think you have to want to, that you want, you have to want to work out. You have to want to get into that groove. And that's a difficult thing to do. But you, when you, when you get into it, you get addicted to it. And I think it's just because like a lot of our society, especially with lockdowns, especially with a lot of work from home stuff now, it is very sedentary. You know, it is sitting down, it is doing nothing. And, and for me, like I have ADHD, that's, that's impossible. I can't just sit down. Like even sleeping is difficult. 30 minutes, I'm up and moving again. But for a lot of people, it's watching TV. It's I had a hard, stressful day at work, and then I want to go home and lay down. And it's like there's not enough movement. But they like watching sports. They like having that. I mean, hopefully during the pandemic, people went outside and actually played a little bit, you know, whether it's a family member or something like that. But it's this movement of getting active. There were a lot of commercials like that when I was a kid. I don't see a whole lot of them anymore on the TV. Maybe it's because I'm just watching the wrong channels or something. But there isn't a giant focus on this whole Get Healthy initiative. I remember Michelle Obama in the White House that was talking about doing all that. Yeah, two things. Um Exercise is a lifestyle. You, you have to make it part of your day, whether it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes, a half hour, hour. You, you just have to, it's, it's a lifestyle. And I think it's so, so important. I know it's important in my life, my wife, my family. Um, the other thing, the American College of Sports Medicine has always pushed this concept of exercise is medicine exercise is medicine there's a lot of truth to that uh, people who exercise are better they feel better mental health issues better physiological health is better um uh, yeah and 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 that i i just i think that those two things is what drives me every day you know exercise is a lifestyle exercise is medicine and i feel good and i you know and hopefully that message is Construed to my students, my colleagues. I um, yeah, to push on society right now. I'm trying to show people that as well too. I mean, like I said, I work at a gym. You know, it's hard to tell someone it helps with stress. People go, okay, well, video games help with stress and all these. I was like, that's true, but there's just a different feeling you get where I'm no, like, no question about it. If they ever put that in a pill, that would be the most dangerous thing ever. Because I'm like, no doubt. You, you gotta for me you gotta work for something like that as well too because i like i get it like you have days where you'll go there and you'll be like oh this is the most difficult thing ever i don't feel like being here but then afterwards there's no better feeling like you just feel like everything you can for me it's before i even do a podcast that's the first thing i do i can't talk to anybody until i've worked out yeah, and it's yeah, just yeah. The overall reset no there's a euphoria there you know you mentioned earlier that endorphins and keflins you know that runner's high yeah. and uh, it's true it's very true. You and I are on the same wavelength there. Absolutely. Now, when it comes to, I guess, any other areas where if we talk about like something similar to an ankle, which would be, a, I wouldn't would say similar, but a wrist, just because I have wrist issues, I have my own questions upon this. I mean, is it kind of similar to just protective methods? You're not using it as much, but I don't know how many people I know that can't close their hand. You know, older people, obviously, but there's these 
fears that start coming up where you start wondering what's going to be like, I know this wrist popping and cracking that I have at 24 is not going to look good when it's 30 or 35. So there's preventative things that I can do, such as wear a brace when I work out or do something. It doesn't look cool, but I don't really care about looking cool when it comes to being able to use my hand later down the road, you know? So I'm wondering if there's like at least similar aspects that we can use from an ankle that we can use from other medic or science that we have in research into these areas when it comes to joints and tissues that we can focus on like just preventative method like if you give a couple tips for someone out there listening that might have an ankle issue or wrist issue or a shoulder issue yeah you know prevention is good you know i think you know anytime we can you know i often ask my students i say what's the most important aspect of our job is it is it injury prevention is it injury assessment or is it injury treatment? And I think when st our students take a step back and really think and do some introspection to that question, prevention is, is key because, you know, if we can prevent these things from happening, they're still going to happen. But prevention is an important thing, you know, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, you know, having good strength, uh, good proprioception, good balance, that's all beneficial knowledge of the game, understand the rules. You know, it's interesting, I, I was at my daughter's uh, subdivision last weekend and she was saying that the pickleball courts just opened at their facility. And that afternoon there was an ambulance there. Again, a classic example of these people thinking that they can just go out and play. They have to, you know, understand the game. They have to be physically fit, et cetera. So prevention I think is, is is a key aspect in moving forward. You know, the other thing that I'll mention about any major joint injury, shoulder, wrist, elbow, hip, knee, ankle, is that we're finding this process of active recovery is, is so important. I'll give kudos to uh, a colleague, Gary Reinel. Um, he's he's called the, the, uh, the anti-ice man, if you will. And he's made a lifelong effort of making sure that people understand that ice is, is not the best thing to do initially in these, these acute injuries. Instead, it's active recovery. It's, it's movement. Movement is important. And people who get these injuries and think they have to mobilize for weeks on end, oh, that's not good. So active recovery, moving, movement is good. Uh, assisting the lymphatic system and getting the, the, the byproducts or the waste products of an injury back to the heart and recirculated so, so important. And so uh, that, that would be my message there in terms of, you know, musculoskeletal injuries, active recovery movement is important early on. Um, ice maybe to manage pain, but that's about it. Keep it moving is important. When it comes to just the area of research with younger generations, are you seeing a lot more kids be interested in down this career path, at least getting interested into injury recovery, um, working in sports or just medicine in general? Yeah, I think so. You know, I think, you know, in our culture, sports, such a huge area. And so, you know, any time for, you know, if a career can go into that pathway, I think is good. And again, like I mentioned at the outset, whether my students are at the high school level, middle school level, collegiate professional level, um, they, they enjoy this environment because you're talking about dealing with a patient who is highly, highly motivated and wants to get better, wants to get better. So that's, that's important. That's important. Well, Thomas, I really appreciate you for doing my show. Um, is there a place where people can find your links? Yeah, they can go to uh, the University of Delaware website. So www.udel, uh, that's U-D-E-L dot uh, E-D-U. And then type in athletic training, type in Kaminsky, and they can find me. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that they might have. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure I link your links in the description. I appreciate you for doing the podcast. And thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Out of the Blind.